Okay, what that was, was a guy on a <coughs> converted wheelchair with the seat taken off, he has a turtle kid's sandbox as the seat, and then he has a subwoofer underneath it, and he's riding around listening to music. Welcome to Hollywood. Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you guys? Man. I had a weird day. Well, I mean, I, I slept in till 11, which is totally not like me. But it was just like such a weird night working that catering event. There was nowhere to park, and then the place that we normally park, instead of charging $5, they wanted $20. And then there were people like when I was walking back to where I ended up parking, literally throwing up on the side of the street. It was just a nut house. So I don't know what's gonna happen today. I text um, Trisha and I asked her if she wanted to go hang out today. So I don't know if she's busy or if she has to work or whatnot, but we'll see when we hear from her. And uh, maybe I'm thinking I might go see the uh, Shakespeare in the Park tonight. I don't know. Just taking John out for a little bit of a walk now and I've already seen one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, that guy on that wheelchair conversion. But it can only get weirder. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. And it wouldn't be a good morning without seeing that guy taking on the world like a champ. How you doing, champ? There used to be a, a lot of tents right here. Before I went to Sweden, this whole corner was full of tents and now I think what, probably what happened was sometimes the police come and tell them they have to pack it up and they leave for a little while and then they come back because they gotta, I mean, gotta live somewhere. The underpass up here also was totally filled and then I came back and they had, I had read on Facebook where the police had come and disassembled it and everything and apparently were really nice about it, but how can, nice can you be really when you have to tell people that have nowhere to live that they have to get up and move away from there too. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but at this point I could definitely say I almost would say I'm a connoisseur of church architecture and this is a nice one. So my buddy Breck has um, the next couple of weeks off, so I think that he and I are gonna go off and do this uh, this series of vlogs that we've been wanting to do. We actually went and saw this place once before, but it was before I was vlogging, and I was just like, I know he would wanna go, and I mentioned it, and he's like, yeah, let's do it. So you're gonna have probably some pretty special vlogs coming up, maybe this week or the week after, hopefully. And right now, I'm also debating on whether I wanna do anything with the solar eclipse tomorrow or not. I do live pretty close to an observatory. Wow. Well, it's pretty sad to report. Um, I saw this morning that Jerry Lewis had died, um, but just now I saw that one of my favorite comedians of all time passed away, the great Dick Gregory. Um, you might be surprised to hear, I know I've shown his star in vlogs before, and you might be wondering how do you, how are you into Dick Gregory? When I used to have my driving job where I drove all night, um, right towards the end of my shift, I miss in the morning would come on. And the only reason I ever gave it a chance was because I was a Howard Stern fan, and I remember how Howard Stern always used to have these battles back and forth with Imus. And so I was just gonna listen to it one day, and uh, just kind of so I could mock it, and then I ended up really loving the show, and Dick Gregory was somebody who I miss had on all the time. Uh, I feel like every two weeks or so, um, and Dick Gregory was just always so funny, so poignant, and always made so much sense, and ever since then I would buy his records, and um, got to see him live once at the Comedy Store, and just a real honor to get to uh, see his work and how his brain worked. And I, uh, I hope if you've never checked out Dick Gregory that you'll check him out. Uh, rest in peace, Dick Gregory. Well, today I just decided to kick it and have a chill out day. I was gonna go to Kevin's house, I was gonna hang out with Trisha, I decided not to go anywhere, not to do anything. And uh, John, I just hung out at the house and 
We watched some baseball, we watched some football. Now I'm gonna go down and tell you guys a little story. We're actually gonna go to the LA Film School, but I'm gonna tell you about what it used to be. Well, here we are, gang. Right here, where these two buildings stand, was once RCA. Many famous albums have been recorded there, but today I want to talk about the very first album by the Grateful Dead. Now this wasn't even an LA band, and yet they recorded their first album here. When the first album came out, they were actually called San Francisco's Grateful Dead. That's what the album was released as. And that studio once sat in the basement of the grounds right here. We're signed by Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers, even though the band wanted to record their album in San Francisco, wouldn't allow it to happen because they said at the time San Francisco didn't have a um, up-to-date enough recording studio with the kind of technologies that they wanted to record this album. So the band came here and recorded in four short days their first album. They had famed producer uh, David Hassinger. who they actually picked because he had done the Jefferson Airplane Surrealistic Pillow album, which Jerry Garcia has been credited as naming. But he also had produced the um, Rolling Stones I Can't Get No Satisfaction. So the guy had a pretty good roster of, um, of talents and, and albums that he had recorded, but the problem was that the band was so infantile as far as they'd been together for such a short amount of time and they really were still young guys. For the most part, they were 18, 19, 20, 21. And they really didn't even know what their sound was yet, so for four days they were pretty much rushed through putting together their album here and then when it was finally finished, Warner Brothers listened to the record and then took like three or four of the songs and cut down the time big time, which is kind of weird to think of now because The Grateful Dead is known for that free form, long song style. And so they ended up cutting that back and you ended up not even hearing that until like way into the 2000s when I think it was Rhino, Rhino Records reissued this first album and they did it with the original um, versions of the songs at the original length. So this was actually a pretty big deal because even though the album wasn't a success here, it, um, it got him a little bit of notoriety because it was getting played in the, um, the radio stations of San Francisco, just pretty much not anywhere else. So this was a real turning point for the band. Um, when they went to do their second album, which was um, Anthem of the Sun, they were sent here again, and they could tell pretty early on that this just wasn't gonna work, that the vibe and everything, the feeling here wasn't gonna work, so they picked up and they went to, um, to New York. And they started working on it there and then found out there that really the only way they could get the sound that they wanted, which was like to capture the, um, the energy of their live shows was basically to take what they had recorded and also interweave like li live versions of the songs or even live um, life parts of the songs into a recorded version and this is actually when David Hassinger quit as producer. Um, Phil Lesh came in one day saying he wanted to go out and record Thick Air which was just basically a big blanket of air and um, David Hassinger was like this is ridiculous we're wasting time and he ended up quitting but why I say that the recording time here that first album was so influential is because the way that they did it here taught them a lesson that they never wanted to learn again. They didn't know what they were doing when they were here, so when they went to do that second album, like I said, they started mixing in the live stuff. And then when they went to do the third album, what they ended up doing was they, um, 
they spent an ungodly amount of time racking up studio bills and um, and debts, basically, and they've, they've admitted it, just learning how to record, like trying out things, experimenting with songs, all the things that normally you don't do when you're in the studio because time is money. They spent all that time to do that there, driving the record label crazy and um, putting out this just psychedelic masterpiece, which was Oxmoxia. And, um, and then they, um, the very next album, they said, well, now we know what we're doing when it comes to recording. So they build a small little studio in San Francisco on the farm and they recorded the album, uh, the next album there, like really simply, really quickly and really low budget. So both Phil Lesh and Bill Krutzman have both went on record in their books saying that this album like almost doesn't doesn't even sound like the band. It was so early in their stages. Phil said like cutting the song short, I mean there was other than Viola Lee, nothing really sounds like them on that album. So when this album originally came out, they actually above the band's name where it said San Francisco's Grateful Dead, they actually had a um, a little like artistic the words were done in a really cryptic way, the no way the Grateful Dead would be known for, and it actually said, um, in the land of the dark, the ship of the sun is drawn by the Grateful Dead. And that was a passage taken from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. But when Jerry saw the album cover, he realized that he didn't really want to do anything that would um, kind of tie them to any imagery or any kind of like pre-made philosophy. So he actually had the, uh, the band's art artist, the guy who had designed it, kind of like um, distort all the lettering and make it frillier and add frills to it and everything so that it didn't read that anymore. So I'll post a picture of that album cover right here. Leave it to Jerry Garcia to uh, change an album cover's artwork because he was afraid it would come off pretentious. Now, like I said, this studio has a very vast history as far as albums that were recorded here, even things all the way going back to Elvis Presley. But today, I just wanted to focus on The Grateful Dead because it was so odd to me that they would record an album in Los Angeles, and it's the only album they ever recorded in Los Angeles. Like I said, the second album they came out here, started and realized it was going to not work, so they just scrapped it. And that basically the way that they would develop their whole style of recording for the next three or four years and what would become their sound started here from a lesson they learned here. It always blows me away on just about every topic what kind of history you can find affiliated with this city. Well, stopped in for a few groceries and I wanted to pay some respects on the way home.